Well, I have with me today one of the most phenomenal people, and I already said, Robert, that you should be up in the Hall of Fame. In my book, you are. You have revolutionized the understanding of mental health with your incredible work, Mad in America, Anatomy of an Epidemic, the, many, the other books you've written, and also your, your webpage, Mad in America, which is a resource that I use daily and I refer people to daily. You have changed the world of mental health, and it's an absolute honor. You have been my mentor without you even knowing. It's an honor to, to expose your absolutely brilliant work to my audience. So thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Well, first of all, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. So thank you for having me. And thank you for those overly kind words. But thanks so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. They don't even do justice to half of what you've done. So I'm excited that this is the first of many interviews. You and I kind of had a whole conversation before we even started. And, you know, you know, people like that I've interviewed, like you work with Joanna Moncrief and Peter Gotcher and and Sammy Tamimi and David Healy, all these phenomenal people, which I am also going to be having on the platform. And That's right great. up front, I'm going to tell all of you in my audience that we will be doing some super interesting interviews and panels with these experts in terms of helping us to change and move mental health forward in the right direction. So, Robert, I'd love you to just tell people how you got into this game because you're a journalist, but now you've become an activist. <laughs> well, you know, I still think of myself as a journalist doing reporting that leads to activism. There's a little bit of difference there, but because one of the things with the journalism is your your duty, your obligation is to be a, an honest communicator of information to the public, your services to the public. And so part and really what I've been involved with is for really more than 20 some years now writing about psychiatry is trying to present what's in the scientific literature to the public, because that's not what the public gets told. The public has been told a very different story. So I, I still think it's very much an act of journalism that I do hope leads to activism, because clearly we as a society, and I'm talking about societies around the world, we have to organize our thinking and our, our care and responses to psychiatric difficulties, emotional difficulties around real science and not around marketing. And that's the problem we've had. Now to go to your question, yeah, I have a long background in, in uh, writing for daily newspapers. I was a medical reporter for a daily newspaper covering medicine and science. And if I were to say the trail that led me to write about psychiatry, it's very specific actually. I left daily journalism in 1994. And I took a job as director of publications at Harvard Medical School. And at that time, there was this big thought is, oh, we have to practice evidence-based medicine. Why? Because it begins with the understanding that there's a capacity of doctors to be deluded about their merits of, th of their therapies. And that's what the history of medicine tells you quite clearly. And it really shows up in the history of psychiatry. Definitely. So that became my understanding is that you couldn't really rely on clinical impressions from doctors because they're always going to say whatever they do works because they have to sort of believe mm -hmm. in it. So you want to go to the scientific literature. So that was the first sort of seed planted that doctors could be deluded about the merits of their therapies and what they tell to the public may not be right. Anyway, then I co-founded a company that looked at the clinical trials of new drugs, but from a business perspective, why, how much money was going into it. And as part of that, publishing company I co-founded, we began to write about how the industry money was corrupting the, the conduct of clinical trials and what was reported to the public. And it was in psychiatry you saw this the most, this mm -hmm. sort of spinning of results, et cetera. So anyway, I went to the Boston Globe, and I also came upon some other information about abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings. And I said, I'll go to the Boston Globe where we had written for before, and I'll do a series about basically abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings. Quick, now the quick leap to how I became writing about the what I call a counter narrative to the a prevailing narrative. When I did that series, my understanding at that time mm -hmm. was that schizophrenia was due to too much dopamine in the brain. And that drugs, by blocking doing dopamine receptors in the brain, brought that back into balance like insulin for diabetes. Now, I was told that by every single expert I called. And finally, I said, can you just tell me where in the research literature they found that people with schizophrenia had too much dopamine? I swear to God, this is what they told me. Oh, we didn't really find that. It's just a metaphor. And I, and I said, well, I understand that like insulin for diabetes is a metaphor or a simile, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But I said, just tell me where you actually found it. And they repeated, we didn't actually find it. And then I said, 
well, why do you tell people this? And why do you tell me this? And they said, oh, because psychiatric patients don't know what's good for them. <laughs> they oh. often resist taking these drugs. And this becomes a soundbite that enables them to know why they should take the drug. And at that moment, I thought to myself, you, you're not supposed to lie to patients. <laughs> you're not supposed wow. to tell people that they have something pathologically wrong just so they take a drug. And I thought, I'm suddenly entering a realm where normal standards don't apply in terms of how you communicate with the public. And that led me to write Mad in America, which is really is a history of the treatment of the, quote, severely mentally ill from colonial times till today. But I, I have to add one other motivating factor here. As a journalist, because I believed about the, like, you know, like, too much dopamine, the chemical imbalance theory, I felt like I had been used to tell falsehoods. Yeah. And, you know, that's not what you're supposed to do as a journalist. So one of the things that I did with Mad in America, and you'll see the, 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 the connection here, is look at, in essence, a history of delusion by psychiatrists about their merits of their therapies. They were constantly saying, oh, this fixes something when you when they were bleeding people or whatever. When what you see over and over again is two things in this history of treatment of, quote, the mad, et cetera, is whatever psychiatrists did, they said it was good for them. So like lobotomy, they said lobotomy mm. won the Nobel Prize in medicine for the person who invented it, which means yeah. you, you remove the frontal lobes, you destroy the frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. And throughout this history, you also see the people who are being treated saying, like, wait a minute, we're not, we find these, we're, we're frightened by these therapies, they diminish our a chance to be, et cetera. So really Madden America was trying to say, what does the science literature tell us from a sort of scientific point of view about the nature of therapies going forward? And really sort of this enduring capacity for psychiatry to delude themselves about the merits of their therapies. So the key here for this, I think, for your audience is I was a believer in the chemical imbalance mm -hmm. story. I actually was a believer in the conventional narrative that the arrival of psychiatric drugs created this great advance in care. We were getting these new drugs that were so much better. So I was a believer. And the where I came to start writing a counter narrative was really by looking at what did their own research literature say? And the second book I wrote, an epidemic on this, looked at a very, a question that is so key to people. How do these drugs affect people over the long term? Because, you know, we test the drugs for the short term, but I wanted to know, well, what happens to people at one year, two years, five years? Because this tells you how you're shaping people's lives. And then, of course, what I found in that book is that there's a great body of evidence that shows these medications for condition after condition increase the chronicity of those uh, of those disorders and also increase the likelihood of functional impairment compared to natural recovery rates. Mm -hmm. So very long-winded story, but I think what's important for your audience is where I came to this from. I came to this from because of basically schooling that you needed to go to the literature itself and, and, and try to make sense of that if you were going to be a good narrator for the public to trust. As you're saying that, you can see I'm nodding my head, and I know you've skimmed across a, a huge amount, and we're going to have a chance to unpack this, but thank you for that very incredibly concise overview of where you came into the story, and I'm so glad you emphasized what people are currently so embedded in, that the, 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 the messaging of the, of the last 40 years of you have something wrong with you, it's your brain, and then we you know, overlook society and all the, all the other actual causes of why people are battling with distress, you know, the whole medicalizing of misery, as Jana Moncrief says. And the pathologizing of childhood, as Sammy Tamimi says. So, you know, we, we really, I really appreciate you diving into that. And that makes me travel to the current situation where you brought out a paper yesterday in Madden America that I read yesterday, Sunday morning. And it's now, it's been released today, I think, or yesterday morning. And I wanted to put that in time because it relates to a paper that Jana Moncrief and Mark Hor Horowitz brought out just very recently that has taken the world by storm. Now, the psychiatrists are saying, oh, we knew this anyway, and you have a wonderful way of handling that, and yet the public have been under this, this misconception that you were under as you started as a journalist of this is the belief that it's schizophrenia is from a lack of dopamine and, and the chemical imbalance myth and all these things that have been this, the story that's been sold to the public. But you and I both know, if you've done all the researches, you've written the books on it, that this has made things worse. We're sitting with, with results where people 
30 years later, people are dying 8 to 25 years younger from lifestyle diseases that are preventable because of diagnostic labeling and drugging and all these the different approach. We've forgotten all about the human and we've gone all to the biology, the whole biological. We've got to try and find a neurobiological correlate. So I say all that to say to launch you into this, and I'd love to unpack this article because it really goes to the heart of the matter and takes you on this journey from where you started to where you are at now. So I've got it up in front of me, but I know you know this off by heart <laughs> and I'm going to either prompt you or just dive in and take it away however you want. Okay, well, let me just the context for what we're talking about here. Yes. This, uh, this article I wrote yesterday on, on a yeah. website I run called madinamerica.com. So what happened was in June, Joanna Moncrief and Mark Horowitz and their colleagues published an article in which they investigated the decades of research into the low serotonin theory of depression. And it goes back to the 1970s, so that's 50 mm -hmm. years of research. And what they showed and found was that there had never been any evidence to support the idea that low serotonin is the cause of depression. And so then the next step is, well, isn't that what we were told to believe? And they also showed that surveys find that about 85% of people in the public, quote, know that, <laughs> that depression is due to a chemical imbalance. So right there you have an astounding thought, an astounding thing for the public to know. How is it that the public came to know that 85% 85 came to know that depression is due to low serotonin when the research literature showed that that hypothesis never had any evidence to support it? And what you see right there is right away is how was the public deceived? Mm. Because that's an extraordinary deception, of course, and it's a it's not a minor deception. So let's imagine you're suffering from this, you're experiencing depression. You go in and you're told you have a chemical imbalance, caught, you have too little serotonin, and now, you, so you say, oh, I have a broken brain. That's the first thing. I have some abnormalcy in me, mm -hmm. and now I got to take a drug to fix it. And since I have this thing, apparently I need to take it for life, okay? Because that's the message you got. It, yeah. it, you, it changed your sense of self and your change mm -hmm. of possibility. So what I wrote about was in this paper is how this deception came about, how it's a form of medical fraud, and how incredibly egregious it is. Mm -hmm. Now, it, I, you went go back to when you I talked about writing that series for the Boston Globe about yeah. Grace Mintley Ill. Well, then I wrote Mad in America. And Mad in America, the book was published in 2002. And at the end of that book, I talk about how the chemical imbalance theory is a, is, is a, is a story of fraud, mm -hmm. okay, uh, related to schizophrenia. And I raised this. You would never see this in cardiology. You would never see this in another field of medicine. So never. how is it that it's allowed that it's okay to lie to psychiatric patients? Yeah. And by the way, when I asked researchers again and again, even for that book, they all admitted that it hadn't been proven true. Now, so that was 2002. I published Anatomy of an Epidemic in 2010. I went over the chemical imbalance story. Now, there's two parts to the chemical imbalance story. And let's say the low serotonin theory of depression. The first is, going back to 1974, and I traced this history, the researchers yeah. are saying, we're just not finding that low serotonin is a problem. In 1984, the National Institute of Mental Health investigate. The National Institute of Mental Health is, by the way, our big research organization in the United States to conduct research into mental disorders. Yeah. In 1984, they concluded, we're not finding that low serotonin is a cause of depression. And now here comes the key moment. In 1999, the American Psychiatric Association's own textbook said, we have not found that low serotonin is a cause of depression. And they said, the very hypothesis was sort of stupid in the first place because it all arose from understanding what the drugs did in the brain and not from studies of depressed patients because antidepressants, they block the normal reuptake of serotonin from that synaptic cleft, that, yeah. that gap between neurons. So serotonin stays longer in the gap than normal. So they hypothesize, oh, maybe depression is due to too little serotonin. But 1999, the American Psychiatric Association says it's dead. The theory is dead and buried. The very next year, the head of the, the president of the American Psychiatric Association writes an article in a, in a popular magazine saying, we now know 
that chemical imbalances are the cause of depression and that antidepressants restore serotonin to normal levels. In 2005, the American Psychiatric Association put out a press release saying, good news, 85% of the public now understands that a chemical imbalance is the cause of depression, or actually chemical imbalances are the causes of all mental disorders, basically. And they said, the public needs to understand that psychiatrists are specialists in treating chemical imbalance. That's the deception so clear. Okay, that's mm. so clear. Now, the drug companies are usually blamed for this. They say, mm -hmm. oh, the drug companies, and you know, in the United States, you can do advertisements. On Direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's true, they did. That's how they promoted their selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors in the 90s and after that. But they couldn't have done this unless they had the cover of the American Psychiatric exactly. Association, the medical profession, presenting to this to the public so they could ride in that sort of deception. So what I did in this paper was, first of all, the, the answer to Joanna Moncrief's paper was quite interesting. So they say, we found no evidence. And so what do the psychiatrists say? Ah, this paper's old news. We've known this forever, which is true. Mm -hmm. They have known this forever, mm -hmm. but they, it's not what they told the public. So, in fact, their confessions, they've known this forever, that it was, well, we discarded this long ago. It reveals the fraud that was perpetrated, not just in the United States, but around, you can go around the world and they've been hearing exactly. about chemical imbalances. Intentionally, deliver, intentionally put out it there. Is, it, it's obviously intentional if you know mm -hmm. one thing and you say another, right? Exactly. And, and, and. And he, the other part of this paper is, can you lie to patients? If you're a doctor, can you lie to a patient, say they have a diagnosis which is caused by a pathology that will be treated when you know it to be false? That's called medical battery in the United States. It, and it, you, if you did it in neurology, you'd go to jail. for Exactly. Example, uh, and you did a fake surgery or something like that. But I just wanted to do here to try to to put a legal context around this, because one of the fundamental principles in medicine, and it goes all the way back to Nazi experiments on Jewish mm -hmm. prisoners and the mentally ill in World War II, mm -hmm. you have to provide informed consent. Now, initially, the principle of informed consent was for research settings, but then at least in the United States, it got extended to ordinary mental care. Exactly. A doctor has a legal obligation to be honest about the diagnosis, the treatments, and the risks, and, and the benefits and risks, because... The person has the right to make an informed decision about their mm -hmm. medical care. That's what was violated. It's been violated for 22 years. Yeah. I mean, you can say it's at least been violated since 1999 yeah. when the APA said it's not true. And how many people are we talking about? Oh, my gosh. But also the whole thing, Robert, around that is the informed consent issue is that psychiatry is the only, and you're probably getting to it. Maybe I'm jumping ahead. It's the only medical branch of medical, the medical profession that, can override a patient's right to choose. So it's forced treatment. And that's a huge issue too. But that's, I don't want to divert, divert but that well, wanted to further. Can I just, there is a divergence here. You're right. This is one place where there is almost embedded in the idea of psychiatric care. They don't know what's good for them. So you mm -hmm. can cause forced treatment. And I think actually that idea is one of the reasons that psychiatry went down this route. I know people whose got threatened with having their kids taken away from them mm -hmm. when they wouldn't medicate them for ADHD. Oh, I know too many two of my patients that were in that position. So what you end up with is because of this lie, the courts think that the chemical imbalance story is true. It's treatment for a known disease. And therefore, if you don't give it to your kid, you're denying them helpful medical care. That's how extensive this lie changed our society. And think about if you're a parent, for example, if you know the literature about the long-term outcomes of, of for kids diagnosed with ADHD. What are the long-term outcomes of stimulants? They're not good. Not at the all. The research showed that, in fact, over the there's no benefit in any domain of functioning, but there are there are adverse effects. Exactly. So you're a you're a parent who knows that, and now you're being forced to medicate your kid. It just shows that this this harm that this deception has done to society after society is extraordinary. And by the way. The, there's been a rise in disability due to mood disorders in country after country that has adopted exactly. this paradigm of care. And the research tells you why that would be so. 
So, oh, but can I inter- can I interrupt you there because you actually yeah. re- mentioned in both your books, I, 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 and I don't want to take you off track, and we'll bring you back here. But you mentioned something very relevant. In you show the research that it shocked you when you were in your early days how in the westernized countries that are getting this kind of form of treatment, they did worse than like in Nigeria and Africa and the various different places in Africa or third world country areas that didn't get the drugs or didn't get as many drugs. There's a massive difference. And that was challenged you to think differently about this as well. Can you maybe just quickly briefly mention yeah, no, about I think that? that? This goes to this whole thing that I was a believer in the conventional narrative. So when yeah. I was writing that series for the Boston Globe, I thought we were making great progress in treating schizophrenia. We had these new drugs that fix chemical imbalances. By the way, if that's true, that's the greatest medical discovery in history. Given the complexity of the brain, if you can isolate the molecule that causes madness and fix it, I think that would be the greatest discovery in, in maybe humankind. All of, uh, in humankind, given the complexity of the human brain. But I actually believed it because that's what they told me initially. Anyway, part of this whole thing where I like to say the scales fell from my eyes, one was the chemical imbalance story. But then also I came upon studies that also belied the story of progress in treating what we call schizophrenia. And there were mm-hmm. two types. One was a study by Harvard researchers that found that schizophrenia outcomes were now no better than they had been in the first third of the 20th century. Now, remember, the story is the drugs arrive in the 50s, and this kicks off this great advance. But in fact, they were no better than from 1900 to 1930. And second, they had actually declined from the 1970s. So that belied the story of progress. Then the real kicker for me was this. The World Health Organization had twice found had quite conducted studies that compared outcomes for schizophrenia patients in three developing countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia, with outcomes in the U.S. and other, quote, developed countries. One study was two years in length, and one study was five years in length. Each time, they first did the five-year study, it was, and they said, differences are so dramatic that being Living in a developed country is, quote, a strong predictor that you won't do well if you're diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Our medicine is so great in Western countries. Why w- and we have all these resources. Why would living in a developed country be a strong predictor? You won't do well if you have diagnosed with schizophrenia. So then in the second WHO study, what the, the World Health Organization investigators hypothesize, maybe the reason for the difference is that patients in the developing countries are are more medication compliant, which is a valid hypothesis. If you think Mm -hmm, the drugs are so mm -hmm. key to long-term, then greater compliance should lead to better outcomes. So they measured medication use in in the second study. And by the way, these studies were done by Western doctors, the diagnosis, so it wasn't a thing of diagnostic differences. They found that in the developing countries, they did use the drugs acutely, in other words, for that immediate psychotic episode, but not Mm -hmm. chronically. They, all, they maintained very few patients on the drugs long-term. So now you had quite clearly this difference in long-term outcomes where patients were medicated long-term, poor outcomes. Patients were in poor countries where they weren't medicated long-term, much higher recovery rates. And then they went back 15 years later and they said the divergence in outcomes remains and what you see is this remarkably sort of high return to functioning. Oh, by the way, in that WHO study, the poor outcomes grew worse with each country's sort of level of maintain, enforcing long-term use. So, for example, Russia was quite poor because they mandated everybody on the drugs. Mm-hmm. So that was part of this counter-narrative. Mm-hmm. And here's, Caroline, the really, there is a moment of real, this story of modern psychiatry on the one hand is a story of great tragedy, great betrayal yeah. of society, great loss. We screwed mm-hmm. up our raising of kids. Mm. Unbelievably. Mm. At the same time, there is a message of, if you go into the scientific literature over and over again, that's a message for optimism and hope. And that is natural recovery rates are from depression, manic episodes are quite high. And even from first psychotic episodes, often even those are just episodic. But we adopted a belief that these are chronic illnesses. Now, if we can go back and try to rediscover that these can be episodic Mm -hmm. and you can look at like, how do people get out of these episodes? You start to discover a, uh, you know, you can have bad times, but people can get out of those bad times. And there's this resilience. And you can also see 
how important environment is. And when I say environment, mm-hmm. I'm talking about friendships, social things, meaning in life, diet, exercise, access to housing. So it completely changes possibilities if we see sort of the failures of our disease model of care and then how it's built up, it's just a marketing story. And then we go back to nature and we see this, this capacity to recover over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we also see with kids, kids, they go through a difficult time. And it's called growing up. (laughs) It's called growing up. And the 16 year old is not mother or father to the 28-year-old or the 35-year-old. In other words, your emotions when you're 16, they're not going to stay that way for the rest of your life. No, not at all. But we pathologize those moments, and that's Mm -hmm. part of the tragedy. Well, you just got me wound up there, Carol. Oh, no. This is you and I can talk for hours about this. I've just written written a book that's about to be released in May next year on how to help your child. You know, as a a parent, how to help your child. There's all these things we're discussing now about, you know, let's just get back to giving our children a, you know, basically. Anyway, so, yeah, I can talk about it. And we can maybe touch a little bit more. If you want to go a little bit more down the route of children, and we can always, we've got, we can come back to that. Or do you want to carry on? Where's, where's your mind going? I want you to be the most comfortable because <laughs> you and I can definitely diverge down many different paths here. Oh, well, yeah, we can go back to this whole chemical imbalance thing. Let's go back to that and then we can okay. maybe wrap up at go the end and touch on a bit of the children. And we'll sure. have you back, as I said, many times. Okay. So. Yeah, I think so. After I wrote Anatomy of an Epidemic, I did start this website called madinamerica.com. It was named after my first thing. Phenomenal our, website. I reckon yeah, everyone will put it in the link, everything. It's an amazing website. Yeah, and we have daily science reports that actually tell this story of like that the conventional narrative just isn't in the science and there's all this scientific findings that's not being presented to the public. So, for example, the low serotonin theory. No regular reader of Madden America believed in the low serotonin theory Mm-mm. of depression because we had had numerous studies actually before the Moncrief that said, didn't find it, didn't find it, that sort of thing. It's exactly. debunked. But here is the big picture and what the mission of Madden America is. Societies around the world organize themselves around a false narrative, a false story of progress. And you can trace it back to 1980 in particular, when American Psychiatric Association published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And they said, we're going now to conceptualize these things as diseases of the brain. And they started telling this story about drugs that fix chemical imbalances. There was telling a story. There was no science behind that conceptual story that they were pitching or that therapeutic story they were pitching. But we, that story was promoted around the world and successfully so. Exactly. And so what we have is a global organization of thinking and of services around a false story. And you, as you could expect, that has done great harm to us as a society, to millions upon millions of of individuals. I just saw a story the other day of st- studies saying one in three teenagers in the UK is now taking an antidepressant. I mean, it's, yeah. It's mind boggling. And, and, you know, if you go to our colleges, for example, mm. entering freshmen, something like 25 to 30% now arrive with a diagnosis and all. And what about the American thing, uh, Robert, with um, how are the Americans now are diagnosing pediatric bipolar at the age of like two? I mean, oh, I mean, that's just, ins- I mean, uh, it's just uh, insanity. Don't, don't get, don't, don't, don't get even, you going. <laughs> Yeah, don't get me going. I mean, I, we can talk about this. They even say you can yeah. diagnose ADHD at two and a two-year-old. Uh, please. And, in, and in the womb. In the womb. They're talking about doing it in the I, womb. And I know. I once was on a debate with someone saying we're going to do it in the womb. And I said, and I literally almost had a meltdown. I said, yeah, that's the most and like frightening thing I've heard in a long, long time, that you're going to pathologize this fetus before they even come out. Yeah. Anyway, so what? we need and what Madden America is about is we need to know the science and we need to listen to people who've been treated, by the way, mm, very important. completely rethink our, 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 our what we know about mental health. And we need to develop a new paradigm of care. And so one of the things we do at Madden America, we have the science every day, a science story. You know, we do these reports like I wrote yesterday, sort of a, a summary of all this information. And then we also do have personal stories. And you know what? We have beautiful. Mm. Over and over again was I had a small problem. I went to my GP or I went to a psychiatrist. I was told I had a chemical imbalance. And 20 years later, I was on 40 drugs and my life is over. We hear that over and over again, which mm. tells you of the 
harm that can come from that false story. Mm. So in a big picture way, what we want to do and what I think is necessary is for society to become informed about actually what the science says so they can see it justifies a very different narrative. Exactly. And the, the hopeful part is the narrative it justifies is a much more optimistic narrative. Exactly. And it talks about how a society, so you don't, you don't blame just the individual. You don't put the problem inside just the individual. You say society can do things. They can set exactly. themselves up in ways that better nurture mental health among their kids, among their adults. Exactly. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I get wound up on this. Me too. <laughs> real, real quickly, <laughs> one quick story. I was in New Zealand a few years ago doing a tour and the psychiatrist comes up and he, he ran a, an experiment that went like this. With new mothers, okay, that began to struggle with, quote, postpartum depression. Yeah. One group was given the drug, okay, conventional medical care. With the other group, he didn't give them a drug, but the response was that we would send someone to the house every day to help that young mother and that young family. Now, which response do you think produced a better outcome? Well, I know which one because I know the truth. So obviously the support. Yeah, the support. It was dramatically because that showed what this person really needed. This yeah. sort of. But do we have care that says send a, send some help or provide no. social help? To no, it's mothers? just the antidepressant. Whack them on yeah, an antidepressant. I get these DMs and questions daily about that. What do we do about postpartum depression? What's your opinion? Should we be taking these drugs? So here, here we have an, an answer. And, and that's an example that if we have a different narrative, yeah, we can create a different paradigm of care. And it, mm -hmm. you know what? It's such... The other thing here is sort of a story of philosophy. And this I wrote about in, in, in this paper we did yesterday. Yeah. The chemical imbalance story is such an impoverished philosophy of being. Mm -hmm. Because all we need to do is like look at religious tracts, look at Shakespeare, look at novels. And what what vision of humanity do you see in this literature? Human beings are emotional. Exactly. Human beings are are. They have ups and downs. They can be struck with jealousy, powerful, you know, it's just, it's a ride being a human being and yeah, growing up. Mm. And it also tells us that it's not just some steady state movement through life. Mm -mm. And then, and it's also clear that the environment matters. And then we change it to this idea that like everything is inside the person's head. That the problem, that is such it's so an wrong. ahistorical, non-philosophical philosophy of being. But that's what we adopted. Oh, we have this problem with the molecule. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I call this podcast Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. And I, one of the statements that I always make, my most recent book is called Cleaning Up the Mental Mess. It is, it's okay to be a mess. You're a human. What we need to do is learn how to create a supportive system that we can. So yeah, some in, in my way, also trying to help support this narrative that we need to be human again, be allowed to be human and support each other through our humanity. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's part of what a rethinking would, would bring us is we would completely remember what we humans are. We struggle. We do crazy things. We lose control of our emotions. Growing up is all about coming to know your mind and trying to come to grips with it and learn to assert some control over the crazy things inside us. So exactly. that's how you clean up the, the mental health mess is you yeah. have a new vision of what it means to be human, which is actually goes back to an older vision. Exactly. It's just what was always said. We just had this blip in our 30, 40 year, 50, 60 year blip that's really messed things up. You know, we said that it's not an epidemic in mental health. I mean, you speak about it as well with COVID and how everyone's just saying, oh, it's an epidemic in mental health, you know, another chance to bring this, narr this biomedical narrative, which is so wrong, to another level. We have to challenge that and recognize that this was a difficult situation. We just have to learn how to manage it. So we say it's not like we have an increase in mental health. It's actually a mismanagement of mental health. That's the epidemic, which goes to your anatomy of an epidemic in Madden America. We're not managing our mental health. We've changed and it's created a problem. But I don't want to take away from your, your explaining well, of this article. No, no. I think, Carolyn, one point on this is this. In the early 1980s, the NIMH conducted a survey of the American population saying, what would you do if you got depressed? And only 12% said they would take, well, we did have antidepressants at that time, but only 12% mm -hmm. said they would take a pill. Now, why did 
percent say no because they understood depression was episodic, mm-hmm. and they felt that by making changes in their life, they could quote write it out and it would pass. And you know, they might talk to a, a priest or a minister or a friend or that sort of thing, but they believed they could come out of it. Now, what were outcomes at that time? Exactly that. That after about a you know, you, you what you would see in outcome studies before the the modern story is that maybe 25% would be well in one month, six. And by the way, this was even in hospitalized depression, 60%, 60% maybe in six months and 85% at the end of one year. So that told of people and this, and when we were talking about this, the symptoms were gone. They were no longer depressed. Okay. So what happened? The American Psychiatric Association, the drug companies, NIMH, ran education campaigns starting in the 90s to convince people that depression was a brain disease, okay? And you needed to take a drug because it was a disease. So that's how we went from 12% to 85% being a chemical imbalance, but it, it, it's such a short time. But it tells you that once upon a time, the public understood this and they had to be basically deceived into believing something else. When you say it like that, it's like shocking. And I know that a lot of the people listening now may feel very, very shocked. And that's why I do what I do and have this platform that we can actually bring the truth to people because we don't want people to be destroyed, which is what's been happening. We've got people dying younger than they should, people living lives, children. I mean, Robert, I don't know if you experienced this, but I would, I've been working in schools and education and medical and my whole life talking and and trying to bring this message through. And 25 years ago, even 30 years ago when I started, I could go into a school, give a talk about mental health and learning and that kind of thing. And it would be, oh yeah, you know, this happened to me. Environment was considered the holistic. The kids would understand that this was something that was because of what they were going through. It was a reaction to life and they, they get through it and with support. Now, if I go into a school, you just bring up the word depression Oh, I've got a brain disease. I've got a chemical imbalance. We've got our Gen Z and Gen Alpha growing up the most medicated in history with the, 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 the worst prognosis for long-term health and quality of life that we've ever had in, in, in history. But I'm talking to the choir here. I mean, it's frightening what has actually happened. Well, I think now we're sort of segueing into what we've done to the kids. Yes. And the pathologizing of childhood is is. A wrong, horrific. It's a wrong of such incredible dimensions. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about what a gift it is to be alive. Mm -hmm. What a gift it is to start moving through life as a four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old. I have grandkids now, and it is such a joy to watch how they move through the world. Curious, interesting, smart, fun-loving. But you, know, you just see the spirit of life come forth. And to think that we're going to have a, me- a response that's going to gradually take that away from those kids, numb their emotions, numb their ability to move through the world. And then when you talk about antidepressants, for example, mm. antidepressants, first of all, the trials show they don't even work in teenagers. Exactly. But what do they do to teenagers? What's one of the first things they do? They remove sexual function. They, you exactly. know, they cause a really diminishment in sexual functioning. And there's evidence that in particular, if you're put on an antidepressant during puberty, and then you even come off an SSRI, say when you're 21, 22, about 25% at least suffer what's called P, P post SSRI sexual dysfunction, PSSD. So, and that means that's often that because it doesn't remit even after years you've been off the antidepressants. It's a sign of a long-term iatrogenic injury. So now let's say to ourselves as an adult society, we have a world where we say to a kid who's depressed, going through the angst of teenagehood, yeah. take an antidepressants, even though we know that the research shows that it doesn't even alleviate the depression better than placebo, and we hide from them all the negative effects, which include moving on to bipolar, sexual dysfunction. Why would you do this to your kids? And why would you get your kids to think of themselves all the time as defective, as having a a brain pathology? You want to encourage kids to say like, 
you know, you have so many talents. Now, maybe yeah. some of you are better in school and some mm -hmm. of you are better in everything. But man, you were born a human being and you've got a brain and you've got physical abilities and you can apply. You know, it's a glorious thing moving through the, the life. And we take that away from them. We take that but, away. Yeah, that is. It, it's just it's just it's a, it's a moral harm of such dimension. Sometimes I just can't take it. No, and I when, can't either. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why and we're what, doing what we're doing. Yeah, it's just, and you know, I know so many kids who are pathologized and then they hit age 18, 19. You, you, you know what they say over and over again? Over and over again. Why couldn't I just be a kid? Oh my gosh, I got that so much as well with patients coming into my, and I haven't practiced for, I mean, I practiced for 25 years. Now I work with public and I get all these emails and, and DMs, but I used to get this all the time. I mean, it's just my childhood was taken from me. Yeah, and the, the experience of it, and no one taught me how to just be a human and manage my emotions. That's why I've just written the book that I have. That we need to allow our children to manage their emotions and and help them to understand that it's okay to be messy and all that kind of stuff. Which is just, you know, Robert, this just makes me think of the, the what you were saying in terms of how I'd love to do two things now. I'd love to con to to kind of have this children focus and link it back to the article that you did because you started at a, at a point where you talk about that this is actually a legal standard for medical fraud. And it goes to the children, the pathologizing of childhood as well. This chemical imbalance is not just for the adults. This is for what's happened with children. And I'd love to touch on ADHD as well, which is just, I mean, it's another whole thing. So uh, yeah, I think because this this fits the two. That's a great. It question. does. It kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. So the article is focused on the low serotonin theory of depression, okay, and and how that was a fraud, and then it just looks at what is the legal standard. And the legal standard is if you lie unintentionally to a patient about their diagnosis and the nature of the treatment, and you you do that, that's medical negligence because as a professional, you're supposed to keep up. But if you intentionally lie, that's medical battery. Now, yeah. in this case, is I think a lot of prescribers don't know this, that the chemical imbalance story is a fraud. So the fraud originates with this guild at the top, the American Psychiatric Association, that began promoting this in 1980s in order to present themselves as real doctors. That's really the story. Yeah, yeah. Okay? They wanted to say, we're doctors in white coats and blah, blah, blah. Doctors in white coats treat diseases. And they wanted to present really an antibiotic model, right? You have a disease yeah. or something like that. But this fraud is not limited to depression. It was the same thing that was used to sell ADHD. ADHD kids have a chemical imbalance or else they... Just dopamine. <laughs> yeah, it's dopamine. Yeah. And it was used in terms of like medicating more and more people with antipsychotics, anti-anxiety agents. So it was a broader story that was used to sell drugs and yeah. also to make the guild look like doctors in white coats. And just to give you an example, from a capitalistic point of view, it was an extraordinarily successful story. So we yeah. really begin hearing it in 1987. The United in the United States. In 1987, we spent, as a country, $800 million on psychiatric drugs. Okay, that's 1987. How much did we spend 20 years later? $40 billion. I mean, it's just like, yeah, I knew this was coming. So that's that comparison. Just say those two numbers again. So in 1987, we as a country spent $800 million on psychiatric drugs. And a lot of it was sleeping pills and stuff like that. In 2007, we spent $40 billion. Now, that's a 50-fold increase in market size. That is a story of a great capitalistic success. But mm -hmm. what happened during this time? First of all, imagine what we could have spent this money on. Exactly. Than, Community but, support initiatives, you know, and a new right. narrative. Yeah, exactly. But what happened to, me quote, mental health during this 20 years? It deteriorated. Terribly. In mm -hmm. every way, what every marker you want to look at, number of disability, number of people like needing treatments, a uh, number of people becoming sort of chronically ill, treat you know, all, all the all the markers show that once we adopted this disease model, rather than improving things, things got worse. So it it the story is this is like a single item example in the in the area of depression, because the the marketing of antidepressants was so profound, but it applies to this whole way this disease mm -hmm. model was marketed. So what you really see here is a story of fraud 
of extraordinary dimensions. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, it's really easy to show, and this is in federal court cases, that informed consent is a central principle of medical care. Practitioner has to provide it to the patient. And why? What's the principle behind informed consent in regular medical care? Because a person has a right to self-determination. You get to be the author of your future life. Exactly. And yet, except when you when you when you got this, you were led to believe, well, I do have a something wrong with my brain. I better mm-hmm. take this. So you built a future for yourself. You made a decision to go down a medicated path based on a lie. Now apply that to kids. You're you're sending those kid li- that that kid's life, that child's yeah. life down this medicated path, and they're not making the choice. That choice is being made for them. For them. Mm-hmm. Really by this fake story. Can you think of anything worse to have a medical discipline channeling kids down this medicated life without consent and w- with a false story? This is the other half of the chemical imbalance story. So when they, so the whole story originates with an understanding of how psychiatric drugs, antipsychotics, and antidepressants act on the brain. They perturb normal functioning. Exactly. Okay. Now you have to go, well, do they have an abnormality they're fixing? They didn't find it to be so. But what they did find is that when you perturb that functioning, the brain, being this extraordinary neuroplastic organ with all these feedback mechanisms, says, "Uh uh-oh, I have to go through these compensatory adaptations. I have to change how my brain functions in order to try to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium, which is the normal functioning of these pathways. And in 1996, our director of the National Institute of Mental Health concluded that after the end of this rather extraordinary, and there's a lot of downstream changes, your brain is now operating in a manner, and this is his words, Mm -hmm. both quantitatively and qualitatively different than normal. So these drugs don't fix an abnormality. They induce an abnormality that changes your brain. And there's some evidence if after you're on these long terms, it's not reversible. Now, that story is never told. No, to it's public. never told. And it's but not it's just depression. Exactly. Oh, it's no, in the no. research. It's yeah. the, the depression. It's ADHD. It's schizophrenia. It's all these labels that are not labels. That are, they're not diagnostic categories. They are descriptions of, some, of, of, of manifestations as opposed to the way that they've been sold as this disease model, as, as we keep referring yeah. to. And, and, you know, so, for example, early on, it became evident that long-term use of antipsychotics led to a lot of people to suffer from tardive dyskinesia. Exactly. But tardive dyskinesia is, 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 it manifests as a disruption of control of involuntary movement. So you get the tongue flashing in and out and other things. But it's actually, if you study, those involuntary movements are really more like the canary in the in in, in the gold mine or the mine, because you see decline in 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 in, in global declines in cognitive function, et cetera, with yeah. dyskinesia. And they knew it's not reversible. They knew. So, and that was due to the mm. drug. And they can even say it's part of the compensatory response. So going back to the 70s, there was in the research literature a model for why long-term use of antipsychotics led to this basically this permanent dysfunction in the brain. And that's not told to people. And now we have antidepressants, for example. Well, early on, there was some worry that they were increasing the chronicity of the disorder and also increasing the likelihood of functional impairment. There was a paper starting in the 1990s saying, I think we're worsening the the course of depression. And by 2012, a very famous mood disorders expert named Rifal Malek, mm-hmm. who actually worked for Eli Lilly at one point, mm-hmm. he presented this paper called SSRIs, how they induce what's called tardive dysphoria, a chronic dysphoric state, and even says, this is what happens to a high percentage of people in SSRIs long-term, and it may not be reversible. Now, how many people who go to a GP or go mm-hmm. to a psychiatrist as they weigh the risks and benefits and said, well, there is this worry over the longer term, you'll become chronically dysphoric. And they don't tell them that. There's not a single person in the world that's been been given that as the risk benefit exercise, you know, 
equation. Exactly. But it's in the research literature. So and it's shouldn't also, the public know this? They should know this. They should be made aware of it. Isn't there also, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't there a document that, I mean, I have read this in various different places, that doctors are supposed GPs, primary care physicians, are supposed to present, it's about 16 pages, and it tells you all the benefits. And it's like a legal document that they should, if you're going to go on an antidepressant or an antipsychotic, these are the potential issues. And if you don't actually show it to the patient and sign off on that, you're not actually fulfilling your legal duty or your Hippocratic oath and that kind of thing. I've made, you may be able to explain it better. I have asked so many people, no one's ever seen that that have been on medications and things. No one's seen that. I don't have, I don't have one person that's seen that. Isn't I, that standard I, of care? Isn't that supposed to be standard of care? It should be the standard of care. What you just said should be the standard of care. Mm-hmm. What's the evidence for short-term effic- efficacy? What what do you know? Clinical studies and real-world patients show because, by the way, the the information from industry-funded trials are conducted in a select group of patients. They're not reflective of what happens in clinical studies. Okay, yeah. so they should know what happens in the real-world patients, and then finally, what happens in the long term. That should all be in there. Now, I don't. It should be part of what you're handed. What I have seen here in the United States where people will write up these, this is what an informed statement should be, and they put them on the internet and all, but no one uses it. So yeah. the, the, the legal standard in the United States is to give informed consent, you have to provide the information that a reasonable person would want to know to make the decision. Well, I think if that's applied, you would want to know all of this information. Exactly. But and nobody, there should be a... Summary yeah, document should... because it's too much for to throw at a patient who's already depressed. So you need to be able to have someone who you know bring a caregiver with or bring someone a loved one and and walk them through those basic things. So that's a legal standard and it's part of and it's this is the only you know if you get a cancer diagnosis you get told of the side effects. If you even that you know even insulin for diabetes every medication has a side effect. But why are we not doing this in psychiatry? You know, this is and, and this is why this that's why it's so important people understand these these illegal infringement that's occurred here. Absolutely, your right to inform consent to make a decision based on on the information that is gathered about what's the nature of your diagnosis. We don't know the causes of depression in the sense of any bi- biology. No, that's been. Do, how does the drug work? Well, it'll perturb this normal serotonin function, and your brain will go through these adaptation. It doesn't. The drug doesn't fix in the balance. And then you have the right to know what its clinical studies shown and say with antidepressants. In the industry-funded trials, there's a tiny bit of benefit on the Hamilton scale of two points reduction points, yeah, on this I mean, 52 really. point, which has no clinical significance. No. And when they measure something called the effect size, basically they say that 88% of the effect is seen in the placebo group. So it's mm-hmm. only like one in eight get, get an extra little benefit. That's in industry funded trials. Yeah. What happened in real world studies, studies of antidepressant therapies in real world patients over longer periods of time? Well, you see extraordinarily low response rates. Exactly. And really extraordinarily low stay well rates. I mean, we're talking about six, ten percent mm-hmm. well at the end of one year, and only a, there was just a study out in I forget. It's a big international study. Here was the range of outcomes in real world patients. About twenty five percent had some sort of decent response, mm-hmm. like a fifty percent mm-hmm. reduction mm-hmm. in symptoms. Mm-hmm. Another boy, I forget exactly what it was. Like that's I think it was I don't know. 37% or something. Yeah. Had no benefit. 41% developed treatment resistant depression, meaning yeah. they worsened. So exactly. what you saw in this real world thing was only a small group. Oh, and by the way, more than half ended up on multiple medications. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that real world study actually showed that you got a lot of chance of ending up worse, worse. than you began. Yeah. And then if you go into the studies of two and five, 10 years, it's all negative for the medicated patients. It just goes, gets worse and worse. You know, Robert, you you have a you have an amazing way of explaining that brain adaptation. You know, you you have a very nice, simple way. Can could for my audience, I think they'd really benefit from if you could explain just what happens with, for example, SSRIs and how the brain adapts in a negative sense and sure. what is being t- and you know it goes to the whole medical versus yeah, this, you know, this drug versus the, disease based model. Yeah, yeah, and 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 and. When you talk about drug versus disease, of course, it's Joanna Moncrief yeah, who you're going to have yeah. who's really developed this. I have a drug-centered model. But this is what patients should understand. It goes to how neurons communicate in the brain. And this was fleshed out really 
beginning in the 50s and 60s. So you have a, what we call a presynaptic neuron that will release a, a molecule we call a neurotransmitter, a chemical messenger. Serotonin is a chemical messenger. That molecule will bind with receptors on the postsynaptic neuron because there's this tiny, tiny gap between the new neurons. And that's how the message goes from one neuron to the second, and that's how pathways work. Now, that messaging has, system has to be crisp. So once that molecule binds on the, the postsynaptic receptor, it's got to be removed right away. And it's removed in two ways. Either an enzyme comes along and metabolizes, say, the serotonin in the synaptic cleft, and those metabolites are carted off as waste. Or they, there's a, a reuptake process that takes that serotonin, it goes back into the presynaptic neuron and is stored for later reuse. And so now you see how it goes. Serotonin, quick flash into the synaptic cleft, it, molecules bind with receptors, and then they're taken back up into the you know, presynaptic neuron. Presyn okay, what does an SSRI do? It's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it blocks that normal reuptake process that evolution designed the brain to work in this way. Mm -hmm. Now serotonin stays in the synaptic cleft longer than normal. So what happens? Well, your brain having all these feedback mechanisms, including auto receptors on the presynaptic neuron, actually both membranes to measure or assess the level of serotonin in this cleft. When the serotonin starts not being taken up, those receptors, as one scientist said, they scream, turn the serotonin machine off. So what happens right away is the presynaptic neuron will start producing, start firing less. So it produces less serotonin and the, the, ser the postsynaptic neurons, they'll decrease their density of receptors for serotonin. They'll become desensitized to it. So what is happening? The drug acts as an accelerator on serotonergic activity. Your brain responds to, by putting down the brake. So a drug by perturbing normal activity causes a physiological change where it actually induces physiologically the very abnormality hypothesized to cause depression in the first place. This you because you, you you're now have your own machinery operating with a break on. Exactly. Now, here's what I suggest to everyone, or you can do this, Caroline. Go to your car today, and for the next year. Every time you drive, keep one foot on the accelerator, one foot on the brake constantly and see how that well you drive and then see what that does to the machinery over time. And exactly. the point is some of these compensatory mechanisms begin to wear down over time yeah. and you get that that's where you're probably getting. Well, and there's all sorts of downstream effects that we don't yes. know anything about, mm -hmm. but basically you're throwing a wrench into normal functioning, which causes these compensatory adaptations and that's why Stephen Hyman director of the mm -hmm. NIMH who by the way was a neuroscientist mm -hmm. said these drugs cause your brain to begin operating in a manner that is qualitatively and quantitatively different than normal different. and that's that and the easiest way to understand is whatever perturbation the drug does the brain op responds in the opposite way so to an antipsychotic which blocks dopamine receptors, your brain responds by trying to increase its sensitivity to dopamine. The uh, presynaptic neurons put out more dopamine than normal, and the postsynaptic neurons actually increase their density of receptors for dopamine. And that, by the way, that increase in receptors correlates with the severity of tardive dyskinesia that, that develops exactly. later on. So that's the that's the model you should understand when you go on a drug. You're not fixing it. You're perturbing normal functioning and your brain's going to change. And it, all the evidence shows it's pretty problematic long term. And that's what you have so clearly documented in your work, in your books, and that you bring up daily in your in Madden America with your science articles, is the evidence that this is actually what these drugs are doing. So used acutely in an acute situation, where it's just a short period of time, but like if you have a headache, you take an ibuprofen, but you don't stay chronically on ibuprofen. The acute use is going to maybe serve a purpose in a time, but this chronic use, the way that people are being told, there is years and years and years of evidence that you have been one of the people has, that has documented so well of this causing this damage. And the story has changed. You know, we talk about just, just uh, transitioning over to just how this is 
two things. The brain, nothing in the brain works in isolation, nothing in the body, our whole no. individuality. So you, we talk, they talk about the specificity of these drugs as though they, an antibiotic is doing the same thing. It's not doing that insulin for diabetes. It's not even remotely the same. We don't know if you do this in the brain, what else is happening in the body. There's just so many biochemical reactions and things that you can't say that. Yet they're telling you that this is very specifically only doing one thing, which is really a concern. That's in itself a legal liability. Well, yeah, well, listen, I mean, you know, there's a lot. Serotonin is not just a, a molecule in the brain. Everybody no, it's 95% it's in, the in the gut. gut. <laughs> yeah. And guess what a lot of people have with trouble after they go on an SSRI? They'll start having gut problems. It's tremendous. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complete misrepresentation of mm -hmm. the human being, which is this... And it's not just everything in the brain. The brain w w is, is, you know, it has such a connection to the body. I mean, they work together. Exactly. It's mind-brain-body connection. Yeah. I mean, there's even like information stored, of course, in your fingertips, so to speak. There's muscle memory. There's Everywhere. all this sort exactly. of thing. Exactly. So it, this is part of this philosophy of being that is so ridiculous that, that, that oh, you have serotonin causes madness. No, serotonin causes depression, dopamine madness. I mean, that's just the dumbest thing ever because all these things interact with each other. There's all these signaling systems. And of course, there's epigenetics. Of course, when you're, huge. Epigenetics is, is why how we are built to have our genes produce different proteins in response to the environment. Exactly. Those are so in other words the genes aren't just like these steady state mm -mm. protein producers. They are able to respond to, you know, messages. Exactly, which and is the 95% is driving that process. There's a whole language going on, a whole communication Exactly. Going on. And so by the way, when you're one of the problems when your receptor density changes, that shows you're having changes in the, the, the DNA of, of your thing, the epigenetic changes, because exactly. that's where you code for proteins. It goes to the whole languaging, Robert, that I understand, I see of trying to create that biomedical basis, yes. and the, 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 the biomarkers. And some of the work I've done is to, I mean, replicating these studies, now I'm doing them in a bigger, with bigger groups, is to show that the, the you're obviously going to have changes in your brain and your body if you experience some kind of trauma. So, um, you know, with the experience trauma, your mind is using your brain and your body, so we're going to see changes. So instead of saying that the cause is in the brain, the impact's in the brain. So I always talk about the brain being a respondent. We did research studies just looking at right down to telomeres and the DNA. We did the whole psychological. The most important was the narrative. We looked at in you know, the blood, ACTH, quarter, all. We did a whole matrix, and those weren't meant to be biological biomarkers. They were meant to show impact. So when we have issues, we have impact. But if we allow a person to be to accept that, to manage that. They, they may get more depressed. For example, we saw some of our patients, our subjects getting more depressed, but the depression had changed from I am depression, from years of therapy and biomedical input, to I'm not depression, I am depressed because of, and I'm more depressed now because now that what I suppressed, I'm grieving. So that depression is a healthy version of understanding. And then we saw these massive changes in telomeres and whatever, and it was all non-pharmacological. Everything I do is non-pharmacological. It was purely teaching people to be okay with their mess and going through a process of acceptance of suffering and how to manage that process. And we show people getting improvements of up to 81%, and you, you know that 81 is coming up quite a lot in 80, yeah. 85. And we've seen that. So, I mean, that's just on a small, and I've done this for years. So I, I'm you know, so passionate about this concept. <laughs> no, Carolyn, I think that's such a brilliant way to, to put these two visions of human beings at opposite ends of each other. Because the disease model makes it sound like your brain is a fixed state, right? Yeah. And it just happens. And once you got a broken but, one, just live with it. You know? Yeah, but then it and basically that you had it in you know all along. I don't know. It's genetic. What you just presented was a story of science about how the human being responds to the environment in all these incredibly exactly. complex ways, obviously designed in some ways by evolution to enable us to respond to the environment. So one shows us as a being moving through the world where we are changed by our environment. Mm -hmm. The other has this ridiculous steady state thing, like the, you're sort of like cast in a mold from the day you come out and that's who you're going to be. And I know you're what you're talking about too, we see in the ACE study, you know, the ACE yes, study in the ACE United studies. States, mm -hmm. that shows so clearly that mm -hmm. early traumatic experiences change a person physiologically. Yeah. And, and you know, it has sometimes long lasting impact. So it, it goes, 
your story of impact on human beings is so important as part of a new narrative. It is so important, yeah. It is so important because then what you can see is that if you can build as a society a more supporting mm. environment, and if someone does fall off the wagon, yeah. how do you help them get back? You see, environments are so important. So important. I began my journey in this in the late eighties, working with traumatic brain injury, because I said in a lecture, and one of our neuroscience, another neuro, neurology lecturer, said, "Well, the brain can't change." Eighties philosophy, and therefore, once you have brain damage, that's it. And there was hardly any research on TBI back in the eighties. I'm sure you're aware. And I thought something's wrong here because we're changing as humans. We're constantly learning and experiencing, so that can't be the the, the narrative. And I started doing some of the earliest research on neuroplasticity. And, and that professor said, oh, that's a ridiculous question. I actually did a TED talk on this. And, and, and I basically said, he said, oh, well, just, you know, that's a ridiculous question. I said, okay, well, give me a population, the worst that you can imagine, and let me go and do research. And he said, okay, TBI, there's no hope. So I said, okay, I'll do TBI. And I started working with that population and showed that if you, I had, one of my main studies I did, that I did on a master's level was a patient who had a traumatic brain injury written off for, I mean, two weeks in a coma. Basically, the neurologist had written that patient off as a vegetable. That's what the parents were told. Your child is a vegetable. That child, they contacted me 12 months after in that window that you're supposed to heal, and that child had come around, whatever, got out of the coma. Long story short, Robert, the point that I'm making here is that those parents approached me in the early days of my research where I was trying to understand, hey, there's more. We can drive our mind. We can change our brain. There's hope here. It's not a fixed thing. There's damage, but there's hope. So if I can show this on a damaged brain, and then we can take this to other populations. Well, that particular subject went from went from patient went from being non-functional to functioning on a second grade level to finishing within eight months going back and finishing school on a higher wow. level academically than what they were before. And that triggered me. Then I thought, no, something's going on here. And that's what I've pursued for the last thirty-eight years. Is that if that can happen, we have really got the wrong narrative. And then I've tried to apply this to other areas. And I say all that to say that your science, your, your approach that you have brought in and this very strong legal language that you're using that's so important is that this we, we have to share this with people. We have to bring this level of hope because we've stolen hope from, our, from the world. Yeah, exactly. You, 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 first of all, that's, a, that's such a lovely story about the capacity even to often recover from traumatic brain injury. Because that does, of course, show the the neuroplasticity of the brain and the ability to brain to at least some extent heal. And in this case, you gave an extraordinary thing. But this goes to, again, the problem with our conventional narrative because it robs yeah. people of hope. Exactly. It says you're going to be chronic and this is all you can do. You, And when what we actually know from science and from history and from life experiences, what we do know about the brain, there's plenty of reason to have hope. Now, maybe not a hundred percent are going to get their lives back, but uh, a high percentage can, and they can have a time of difficulty. And you can, and you can grow through that and you can get to another level. It may not be the same as before. That's what I had with a lot of traumatic brain injury. They may not, I had people that were CEOs, and they had brain injuries, and they transitioned. They became another, an, another profession. So there's that reconceptualization of, of a, a renewal of your life kind of thing, which is not being told to people. That you know, the, the illness model doesn't share that with people. You know, there's two studies in the literature related to this, of going through a process. One was a study of depression, and it was depression a big study by the NIMH in the 90s that looked at outcomes for six, at six years for people who took antidepressants versus those who did not, and they matched them in terms of severity and class and all that sort of thing at the beginning. Well, those who took the, depre- the antidepressant were seven times more likely to go on disability. Wow. Okay. But here's what they found that was so interesting. The people who did not, and they also were very likely to have a decline in sort of a, a, earnings, that sort of thing, not yeah. just doing well in the job. The people who didn't take a drug six years later were earning more than when they when they were first became depressed. Talk, In other words, wow. it became a process mm-hmm. to make changes in their life that yes. you know, six years later, they, they were in a different spot. So that's one. There was a famous study done by the NIMH that looked at recovery from a schizophrenia, you know, people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia, those who were medicated and those who were not. 
And it was the group that weren't medicated that actually were doing better at the end of one year. And they asked, you know, they were both symptomatically and in functioning. Mm. So they then asked the patients, what was it like to go through a psychotic episode without having your feelings numbed by a drug? And here's what they said. Oh man, it was horrible. It was mm. pain. No, but, but, but there's a, but here it was painful. But they said they were grateful they had a chance to go through it because that was a way, the experience became a way to better handle difficulties in their life. So they did say it was painful, Mm. but they were grateful of having the chance to having gone through it, you know, with having emotional responses. And the best outcomes in the Western world for newly psychotic patients, don't people on antipsychotics right away, and it all be. And the idea was because without the antipsychotics, they could bring an emotional engagement necessary to go through some sort of transition to to come out of this. Uh, So that's exactly what you're saying in terms of how process sometimes. And, you know, grief, how do you get over the loss of a child or someone? You've got to go through a grieving process. Yeah, you do. And you're going to miss them for the rest of your life, by the way. It's not abnormal to have a measure of grief. That's part of how you move forward. Exactly. It's part of how you move forward. And they're talking about the grief thing. Look how they have now pathologized grief in the DSM. And you know what I'd love to in just, we're going to have you back as I keep on saying, but I'd love to hit two topics that we can touch on and then dive into deeper next time. And that is the DSM. And I'd love to touch on ADHD. And I know those are big topics, so we're not going to unpack all of it. But just, you (laughs) know, you've laid a really good foundation. So... Which so real, real quickly on both, on DSM, the big moment that really led to this current disease model is in 1980. That's when the American Psychiatric Association publishes DSM-3. And what they do at this time, now there's no scientific discoveries behind DSM-3. It's not like they discovered that, you know, depression was due to too little serotonin or anything like that. They didn't s- discover any precise pathology. But psychiatry in the 1970s felt under, they were, they, they were saying in their own documents, we're fighting for our survival because, you know, our, our therapies may not be, our psychoanalysis may not be effective. Our diagnoses in DSM-1, DSM-2 are n- not very valid. You had a movie like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And finally, people were getting addicted to benzodiazepines. Yeah, very bad problem then. Mm-hmm. Bad problem. So... With night, with all this, you can see in their own literature, they said, how can we restore the image or improve the image of psychiatrists? And they said, we need to put on the white coat. Mm-hmm. We need to present ourselves as real doctors who treat real diseases. Mm-hmm. So they form this DSM-3, and they're going to say, we're going to call these diseases. Now, even in DSM-3, if you read it carefully, they said, we don't have evidence of this, but we're confident that we will get evidence over time. Now, that's the first thing. Now, the second thing about mm. DSM-3 is, I forget how many disorders are, maybe like there's 200 and some something. Something, yeah. They also said to themselves, we need to have a category that we can place everybody who comes to us for help. So someone who's going through None a divorce specific. and says, mm. I'm Oh, well, we need a disease category for that. And then it might be whatever it might be. So at this moment, they get all these disorders and they're going to say, we're going to call all these diseases. Now, who love that? The drug companies love this because you can't get approval for a drug to treat unhappiness or, you know, uh, I'm upset because I got divorced. There's no that you can't get FDA approval for that, but you can get FDA approval for a disease called depression or a or. You know, if a kid's not behaving in school because ADHD comes to us from DSM-3, there was yeah. no attention deficit disorder before Come that. From D- yeah. yeah. I can't get a drug approved for making a kid stay still and talk- talking less in school, but I can for a disease called ADHD. So what you see is emotions getting put into this disease category, many that had been with us forever. Mm-hmm. That's a big conceptual difference without scientific, you know, reason to make that yeah. thing. And by the way, 
right after the, the American Psychiatric Association makes this conceptual change, they set up a PR machinery to start selling it to the exactly. American public. And there so was no science behind it, no, the ADHD. But, it was, and, and Robert, I don't mean to interrupt you, but would you yeah. mind just telling the audience that the DSM, there's no, it's the diagnostic statistical, there's no statistics. It's a group of people making decisions. A group of oh yeah, yeah. You just have people in a meeting and saying, "Let's let's say that's this symptom no and that research. symptom." There's no research saying that this is going to actually produce a line between those who do and do not have it. And by the way, when they were doing DSM five and they were meeting panels, did you know what everybody actually said in those panels? These are constructs, you know. And, and you know, none of this has been validated as real mm -hmm. diseases. That's among themselves. Among but is themselves. that is that message given to the public that these are Not just constructs? All. You're like you either have ADHD or you don't have ADHD. Mm -hmm. So that's the diagnostic deception. First of all, the conception was just done for political reasons, Then, but then they went into this PR to sell it to us. Now, by the way, this doesn't mean there can't be biological things that cause, you know, psychosis well, the, or whatever. A trauma or a, 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 a tumor or something like that. Yeah, but there's sure. the impact, yeah. Or insomnia or whatever. There's a lot of yeah. things that actually can be a physical, you know, stir for this sort of thing. And by the way, lead poisoning, for example, toxins, yeah. those sort of things. Yeah. So that's the DSM. You have to understand that the DSM is a political document and mm -hmm. away from it, people say, we're just, you know, these are constructs. They're not validated disorders. And by the way, what did the drug companies do? They then began paying psychiatrists at academic centers to yeah. make it easier to diagnose people because the more you could diagnose people, and ADHD is a classic example, classic. and I'll go into that in just a second, the more you can medicate people, okay? You can expand the market. So AD, ADD, there was no such diagnosis before 1980, mm -mm. okay? Mm -mm. What happened was they were start using Ritalin to quiet certain kids because Ritalin is known to make you less engaged socially with your environment. Mm -hmm. So they first say ADHD, ADD, attention deficit disorder, affects about 2% of people. Mm -hmm. Then they make it easier to diagnose in DSM-2, and now it's said to be 4 or 5. Then, sorry, DSM-4, sorry, I said that wrong. So DSM-4, like in, well, there was first an adjustment. DSM-4 was in 1994. They make it much easier to diagnose, and now they say, doctors getting paid by drug companies oh this affects five to ten percent of people and if you don't medicate your kid they're going to have a terrible outcome so what you see there is fungible constructs around adhd that then get presented to the population as if there's something distinct about adhd when mm -hmm. all you're doing is basically saying, we'll give them these questions, you know, about how well yeah. they do homework and stuff. And the kids that score at the upper end of like not doing well on that, that questionnaire, we're going to say they're going to be have ADHD. And yeah. by the way, it changes. Sometimes it's like, well, we'll call the top 15% of ADHD. Sometimes we'll say the top 10%. Sometimes the top 5%. What you see is those questionnaires just produce a spectrum of responses. They, there's no defining line no. between ADHD and not. And you're just lopping off the end of that spectrum of responses for kids that in some ways actually don't do so well in school or behave well in school. It's a behavioral thing, by the way. It's not a, it's not a biological question. No. It's a behavioral thing. Did you yeah. tap your fingers? You talk too much. Meanwhile, that's sometimes how people process information. Sometimes people need to tap their fingers. I mean, the whole thing is to back to front and distorted. And this was, I was in university in the eighties when this was introduced and i mentioned before we started we had some professors saying this is going to be a major problem and it was a good a correct prediction and then seeing seeing how that just played out in in just over the years how that played out but robert there's no genetic cause biological cause brain difference in in these children and so many of these kids i used to get so many referred to my practice and you get to know them you find their identity you show them how to learn they become brilliant academics and Fantastic, fantastic kids in society that first has been written off as a behavioral issue landing up on polypharmacy. So, you know, what you just said, you'll hear that there's a genetic difference. You go to the, oh, yeah. you go to that, the you websites. Go to, yeah, yeah, but you go to the research, it doesn't hold up. 
No. You'll hear that there's difference in brain morphology or whatever, you know, size of brains. We wrote about this. There was one thing, ADHD yeah. kids have smaller brains. Well, if you went to it, <laughs> there, you there analyze was almost complete that overlap, okay, in totally. terms of brain sizes. You but presented they don't tell that study. You that. No, they don't. You present, I think it was 2017. You presented that study and you an analyzed it beautifully in Madden America. Yeah. We'll put um, that link in the in this paper as well. Put that link because it shows part of yeah. the deception. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the final thing here is, you know, if you go into schools and change the environment, there's somebody named Howard Glasser who yeah, does I know something called the, the mm -hmm. Nurtured Heart Approach. Mm -hmm. When they go in and change the environment in the school, guess what happens? ADHD behaviors go way down. Academic exactly. achievement goes up. So really what we would be saying, if 10% of our kids or 15% of our kids don't like school, maybe there's some problem with With the environment. Schools. Exactly. You know, Robert, I had a, tr a tremendous privilege for 25 years in South Africa going into schools and doing exactly that, working with, they, they just gave me carte blanche and working and changing environments. And we, you can't, we got kids that were, that schools that were off the radar in the apartheid era that were becoming the top schools recognized by education advisor, by changing environments. I did work in this country as well, in charter schools. You change the environment, you change the way that a child functions. Those kind of IEPs and individual, you know, education programs and things that changes because you change the environment and recognize. So I don't want to go, talk too much about that, just say that I agree I've seen it. I've worked with this. I've done years and years of work in this. This is truth. ADHD isn't this thing. And, and so that related to that, I wanted to just quickly, if you've got a few more minutes, ask you, it, it's all kind of related to the DSM, ADHD, everything we've been saying. The concern that the advances in fMRI technology in the mid-90s when, you know, the uh, MRI, fMRI, spec scans, et cetera, just a little bit before that, how those have been so misused in the diagnosis of actually all the psychiatric dis diseases, but it's been particularly bad with you know, these doctors yeah. that are saying, hey, look at the scan, and that is depression. I use QEG in my own research, and I would never say that. All you can actually say is that that's how the brain is responding to how you are in the moment. Well, f yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, the scans do not tell a pathology. No. Second of all, they're composites. Exactly. They're not individual scans. So the, it's not like, oh, here is a, all individuals with depression have a scan that look like this and all that do not have a scan that looks like that. And therefore we can use the scan to be an example of depression. Those are composites. They just take a bunch of scans of a bunch exactly. of people and there's a little bit difference in the, the blood flow or something like that. But they don't tell people these are no, composites. No, they make out, well, aggregates, yeah, they, 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 they make out that that's a depressed brain and You've got that pattern, therefore this is your, that's your disease. Well, yeah, and the other thing is, my brain probably is functioning a little different if I'm depressed than I'm happy because that's the only way I can experience these different moods. Exactly. So, yes, but it's, 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 it's a few, it's, it's, it's the impact, not causing, the cause. It's, exactly, exactly. This, my brain does function differently in order to register depression, anxiety. That's true. Exactly. But it's it's not the cause of it. It's, it's just impact. what you said. It's the impact. It's mm. it's the mechanism. It's often really the yeah. mechanism for feeling depressed or feeling exactly. grief or feeling anxiety. To prompt us to respond, not exactly. to not That's to suppress not to suppress yeah. with the medication, which then doesn't allow right. you to heal. Right. That's an example again that of deception. The composites are are presented as individual brain scans, which they're not. Mm -hmm. And second of all, they're presented as showing that this is the cause. Your brain is permanently functioning in this different way. So it's it's mm. it's once again this deception about what's going on. And totally, and there's another element to that, and I'm sure you've addressed that. I know I think you've met you I know it's been addressed in your in Madden America, but that's the whole nutritional psychiatry, which is a huge move, which is just another, you know, additional let's put an external substance in to fix this broken brain that you as an individual have versus looking at the whole neoliberalistic neo and competitive and environmental and epigenetics, all the things that, you know, social structures that are wrong, you know, all of that. Let's just now give you, take this substance. So it's once again an additional external. And then yeah, this yeah, is yeah. now, this little one substance is going to fix your depression. It doesn't work like that. No. I do believe that not these one thing little what you're talking about, yeah. but I do think it's sort of a holistic approach as you try to change you your life. See, yes, yes. A good yes. diet is good. You know, get Thank away you from all the Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, I think, part of a holistic response. We have to look after our brain. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But what you're talking about, that's more of the same. It's, it's, it's just a variation on the scam. On you know? the same scale.
variation yeah. of the same scam and on the same scale. As a human, obviously our mind works through our brain and our body. We want to keep it healthy. So exercise, yeah. nutrition. But just to take a substance and say, hey, if you have this, it's going to fix that. And, you know, the yeah, yeah. Whole, it's, it's become story. another whole industry in itself. Right. But it has the same reductionist model to it. Exactly. That reductionism, which is, I, you and I could talk for 25 hours nonstop. Mm-hmm. I can see that. And I'm so excited to have you back again sometime if you will come back. And love to do a panel with you with all the, you know, Peter Gotcha and Joanna and everything. I don't even know how to thank you enough for the work you do in this incredible interview. Would you, is there something that some pearl of wisdom that you'd like to just share with my audience to wrap it up until they hear you next time? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me on and thank you for the really nice interview. It was really fun and I hope revealing. The, the message Fantastic. I just like to give to people is if we can actually have an honest paradigm, we can hope again and we can find solutions again and we can build better environments. So so this is not a pessimistic story. This is an optimistic story. And it's one that celebrates within us, within human beings, these extraordinary capacities we have to overcome horrible setbacks, but also to understand the obligation we have to build societies that are more nurturing of us all. So that's, I think, the final message is when you critique this, you say, well, what you are offering in return to the critique? Well, what's out there in nature is an unbelievably optimistic story, if we can just grab it, about how extraordinarily resilient and adaptive human beings are and, but, mm. and how responsive to the environment. Oh, I love that. I love that you brought up the concept that we're not as fragile as the messaging is telling us. Not at all. Not at all. So that's that's a beautiful way to end this interview. And Robert, how can people get hold of you? And we'll put all these links in the show notes. Easy, the easiest way to uh, get hold of me, you can go on madinamerica.com and you can go to the About Us and it tells you how to contact me there. But here's how they can do it. Just just email me. And I'm really good about getting back to people. And the, the best way to email me is all lowercase, Robert, period, B as in boy, period, Whitaker, W-H-I-T-A-K-E-R, at iCloud.com. And I do try to respond to everybody who writes me. Well, that's amazing. You might get inundated and wish you didn't say that because you're going to get lots of queries. But Mad in America is a website I recommend to everyone that you actually just follow daily. I read everything daily that comes out of Mad in America, and I recommend Robert's books. And Actually, an Epidemic is a great place to start, Mad in America, I mean, you've written a series of books, but a good place, I think, would be to start with Anatomy of an Epidemic. I think so. Place is the history beautifully. Thank you so much for your time with me, and I really am excited to see you again soon. Caroline, thanks for a great interview. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.